ISO FileMaker Magazine, the professional's resource for FileMaker know-how. Well, hello there, and welcome back to yet another FileMaker tutorial video where we're learning more about FileMaker Pro. My name is Matt Petrowski, and I'm bringing you these tutorials over at my website, FileMakerMagazine.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, then please consider subscribing, or if you find information in this video that really helps you out, at the very minimum, give me a thumbs up, and that helps me out with my rankings here on YouTube and gets me more exposure so that I can bring you more content. In this video, we're taking a look at a topic of providing user feedback and doing it in a creative way. So let's take a look at the file and see what I'm talking about. All right, so here we go. On my website, I've been creating a series about a custom function database, which is a FileMaker database designed to store custom functions so that you have a central location where you can basically just collect the custom functions you create and those that come from other sources. Now in this video, we're taking a look at a pretty cool technique where in my UI, I've got some very obvious functionality. I can click the plus sign in order to create a new record. I can click this little item right here in order to filter the records by different sources. For example, my functions show everything, Brian Dunning, which is a website of FileMaker functions and the FM functions website. But what happens when the user actually clicks a button? Typically you want to provide some type of feedback and commonly we can use dialogues or we can use other things on screen. And in this video, we're taking a look at this technique where I'm going to click the little um, icon here and you can see that what happens is that text scrolled in and then scrolled out. So if you're familiar with FileMaker at all, then you know that that was actually done with a um, a FileMaker slider in order to show that text. It's a nice little effect. But what I'm going to show you in this video is how you can do this not for just one piece of text or for one type of alert, but for multiple different types of alerts. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to go into the scripts for this database. I'll close that one. I'm going to go to the script where we actually have the actual code. Now there is a script that we're looking at right here of show header message. This is the script that we're going to be seeing in the rest of this video. But notice that the way that the script is named of show header message of the type, the message that you want and how many seconds you want it to be on screen, we can actually pass it a type. So let's go ahead and modify this really quickly. And I'm simply going to make one little change. I'm going to change this word from info to error. And I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to say OK. I'm going to save this script and let's see what happens when we click on this script or this button tied to that script of copy to clipboard. We get a nice red indicator of copy to clipboard. It's a different icon. It's different. Well, we can control the text. Right here, all I have to do is change that. Let's put in a warning, for example. We'll edit the actual text and say, we had a problem. And that's pretty much all that I need to change in order to make this one little change in my user interface. And now I'm going to get a red little thing with a warning icon or an orange, excuse me, and a change of the text that says, we had a problem. So in the rest of this video, that's what we're going to be taking a look at, how you actually implement this into your own FileMaker file. So let's head into it and tackle the task. All right, so the first place that we're going to take a trip is FileMaker's layout mode. Going into layout mode with Command or Control L, we're going to be able to see the elements that are required in order to make this happen. Now, if you do not have this layout objects palette over on the side here, you are working with a copy of FileMaker earlier then version 16. Version 16 is where we got the layout object palette and it makes it much easier to work with FileMaker layout objects when considering a technique like this because we have embedded objects. Now quite clearly here in the middle is where we're going to find our slider object. And as I select this, you can see that it's showing me that I have a slide control right here selected that slider happens to have two different panes. As I double click and I get the slide control setup, I can see that there is one of two. Now quite clearly the very first slider of the two is blank and if I click to advance, then I get the next slider and on that slider panel is the ability to see the button bar. 
So over here in my layout objects, I can see that I have a button bar object right here with one, two, and three different calculations or individual button segments. Now you notice that on these button segments, there is the eye indicator, which is telling me that there is a hide calculation on each of these particular items. That can be seen when we're taking a look at our inspector palette over here. And we zoom in to see under the behavior section that we have a hide object when, and this is saying if is empty, a global variable called message.info. And we also want this to apply in find mode. Of course, none of these will be visible at all if the slider is on the first panel of the two available sliders. So if it's on this panel right here of blank, then it won't be visible. None of this, the bar will be visible. So let's talk about that uh, thing that I just mentioned there, blank. You must name all of your objects when you're going to do this type of technique because you're going to be using a lot of go-tos and refreshes. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but at least enough in order to make this happen. So the first panel in this slide control is called slider.blank. And that's just how I happen to name all of my objects. Naming them according to what they are, according to how FileMaker actually calls objects is just much easier. So sliders are sliders, portals are portals, button bars, I shorten those to bar, fields are fields, text are text, and so forth. Just makes it really easy. Then I use the dot notation in order to further segment out the naming of that object. So I have a panel that is a slider dot blank, and I could, by the way, use panel, but the reason that I don't use panel is because both tab panels and sliders reference panels. A given panel of a slider versus a tab control, if I called them both panel, then I wouldn't be able to differentiate them between a slider versus a tab. So I use slider for slider and tab for tab, even though what we're actually dealing with is the actual panel within a slider or the panel within a tab object. So that's my reasoning there. So here with the bar message and our four, our three different segments, you simply just anticipate all of the different types of messages or types of icons you would want to show. So as we zoom out here, we can see that the icons that I've chosen to use is I've got one of FileMaker's default uh, icons with the octagon or the hexagon. What is it? Yeah, it's a hexagon. Then we have the warning triangle and then we have the info I. So you can add as many different segments to the button bar in this second slider panel that you want to actually show. The rest of whether or not they show is determined based on those hide settings. And as we look at the different ones, and we'll zoom, let's see if I can actually zoom in here so that we can see both. We can see that we've got message info, and if I select on the first one, that one's message error, and then this middle one is message warning. Now the one thing I want to point out is that it would be possible to use the same global variable on each and every one of these button segments. The reason that I chose to do it in multiple different ways is just for the sake of my own clarity. Um, I could have used just a general global variable called message. But I tend to reserve that for on-screen messages that I'm going to simply show when it's just a text object. When I'm embedding it and it's a specific type of message, then I tend to actually further name those out, such as .error, .warning, .info, and so forth. Now you can see that each of these button objects simply use a single step of go to object going to an object name. Now what I'm doing within this single step, if we look at this, and it's the same for all three of them, the go to object is actually using a let function first off, and that let allows me to reset any local or global variable. So in this case, for the message alert, I'm simply going to reset I believe it should be, uh, this was when I had it named something else. Please don't be confused, sorry about this. This should be let message.error because I believe that's what the, the actual, uh, yeah, it is right there, message.error. So a little bit of error in my code there, I need to fix that. Go ahead and do it right now. 
it should be message.air. And a copy of this file will be av uh, available for download all over on the magazine website. But you can see that what I'm doing is the ultimate object that I'm going to is slider.blank. Now the reason for that is, is we have a few different options in terms of what we can do with our script. Our script, when we click any button, can use this central message in order to display any one of these three possible options. I can show an error, a warning, or info. All I have to do is put a value into the global variable of message.error or message.warning or message.info, and then the script that is called, which will show this information, simply goes to the second slider, does it with animation on, and then I set a number of seconds. If the seconds are set, then the script continues and it goes back to the blank panel. If the seconds are not set, meaning you set them to zero, then that means that these values will stay and persist on screen. Then by clicking one of these values, you're actually telling, or the user is confirming, I saw the message, I want to go back to the blank panel. And that's exactly what happens. So let's take a look at the script and see how that actually works. All right, and here's the final part to our technique. It's the script that makes it happen. Now remember, we have set this up as a dedicated script that can be shared across the whole solution. Hence, I've put it into a folder named shared because any other script can call any of these scripts. So the, the script is show header message and it wants a type of message, info, warning, or error. It wants the name of the message, and then it wants how many seconds it needs to stay on screen. And that's exactly what the script is doing as we take a look at it. So here are our inbound parameters. First, we need to get the type. We do that with the get value, script parameter, and one. Our message comes in, and we're using a custom function called parse quoted. And parse quoted is basically going to convert the contents of a global variable into a proper format if it has returns included. That's because if you're going to pass in a message that does have returns included, we have to put all of those, we have to convert those returns into non-returns or put the, so that everything is on its own line. We can see that because we're using the get value line one get value line two, get value line three. If this second line actually had returns included in it, then that means that it would mess up the line three. So everything has to be put onto line number two. And when it comes into this script, we then use this custom function of parse quoted, which converts the return, the carriage returns that FileMaker has specifically escaped into the proper format so our message can actually be and support multi-lines. You'll have to take a look at that when you're going to pass a value. That's what I need to show you here is under the copy function. When we take a look at the parameters, if this was going to include carriage returns such as this, copied to clipboard, this is a second line you would need to actually put in the FileMaker quote function as such, just like that. That is the way that you would be able to preserve this recarriage return. But you need to make sure that the height of your button bar segments are high enough in order to support showing multiple lines of text if you're going to use this type of feedback and messaging system. So that's just a tip in terms of if you're going to support lines and the reasoning for the uh, parse quoted function. That's what it does is it actually parses that quotation and puts those returns back in place. So heading back to our script, we can take a look at it. We can see that all we're going to do is we're saying, what is the type of message? If it's an error message, then we're going to set the variable of message.error to whatever message came into the script. Same with warning, and then finally, everything is going to default to a info message if it's not an error or warning type. Then finally, here's the core of the script right here. That's basically it. Four steps. We're going to first go to the slider.blank 
We're doing that so that we can hopefully get the animation to show. Now the animation is not always 100% reliable. On my machine, sometimes you'll see it when it comes in, but you'll always see it when it goes out. Sometimes it won't show. It just all of a sudden shows up. I think FileMaker has some bugs with regards to the uh, animation and how it's showing. Sometimes you can add a few extra steps here and there in order to try to get it to work reliably, but FileMaker does have some issues when it comes to animation on desktop. And finally, we go to the object name. Now a key thing here is you always want to set the message that's going to show up within the calculated segment of a button bar before you actually go to the object. If you go to the object, then set the message, you might get it to reliably show, but if it's set before, then you always know that it's pretty much going to be there when you actually go to the particular um, object. And finally, we're refreshing the object of the bar message just for the sake. When we actually go to the blank and then go to the message, that should render the object, but just for clarity and for you know peace of mind, I put the refresh object to refresh the actual bar message here. And finally, we have this segment right here of our script, which is if the seconds is greater than zero, then we're just going to use a pause step, wait for however many seconds we specified, and then we're going to go back to the blank. If there were no seconds, then we never really go to the blank, we just end up staying on the slider dot message. And that's the reasoning that each of the segments themselves say that they can, uh, you can click on them, and when you do, you'll go to the slider dot blank. So it's a forced confirmation from the user. And then finally, at the very end, we always want to reset these after things have been uh, shown on screen, and that's to just clear them. And again, I'm using three here just for clarity, the fact that I could have an error versus a warning versus an info. But again, you could do all of this with one single global variable. Having that one single variable be in all of the individual segments, you would just have to find a different way of controlling when they show versus when they don't when it comes to their hidden status. I just found that it was easier to use this on the hide object win of the message.error, message.warning, message.info. And finally, the last thing that we have here is we've got some conditional formatting. As I right click on the object and choose conditional formatting, we can see that if we do not have an empty message error, we're simply going to color that one red, and likewise, we're going to do it orange with the message.warning. And that's pretty much how this script is actually going to work, and this technique. It's a great way. I've showed this in other videos as well. There's different variations of using this technique, but it's basically multipurposing a button bar for the sake of being able to show whichever segment you want based on hide calculations, and now I'm joining it with a slider in order to actually get the cool animation of having it come on and off screen. And again, when you click it, many times it will just show up like it did there, and then it will roll out. But then sometimes you click it the second time, then it rolls in and it rolls out. I wish it would reliably work on roll in and roll out, but you can see right there, something in FileMaker's code doesn't actually like that. But I hope throughout the course of this video, you've been able to get a better understanding of FileMaker. If you liked this video and it taught you something and you'd like more in-depth videos like this, I encourage you to check out my website where I release a new video that's part of a subscriber series that subscribers get to access, where even throughout the course of a year, the price alone for a subscription will pay for itself many times over for the time that you will save in terms of the tips, tricks, and techniques that I teach you. And of course, if you wanna watch all the free videos that I'm posting on YouTube here, please, again, feel free to subscribe. And at the very least, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. So much luck with your own FileMaker development, and until next time, happy FileMaking. We hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial, and we'd like to say thank you for your subscription and your support. If you're not already a subscriber, head on over to www.filemakermagazine.com slash subscribe for more information about the benefits of joining.